Thank you, Ann. We have come into the presence of Almighty God this morning to give him praise, honor, and glory. Please join me as we stand and sing hymn number 304, Crown Him with Many Crowns, the Lamb Upon His Throne. Let's go to the Lord God Almighty in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are blessed to be called your children. We praise you this morning. We thank you, Lord God, for the gift of gathering in your name. We're thankful, Lord God, that you've blessed us with the privilege of uh, singing praises to you. We're thankful, Lord God, for this prayer and for the many prayers that are being lifted right at this moment. And we praise you, Lord God, that we can come into your house and allow your word to be spoken, taught by your spirit throughout this morning. Heavenly Father, I pray for this time that we've gathered. I pray that it'll be everything you've called it to be from the very beginning of time. I pray, Lord God, that we will lift up your name, the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and that every element of this service this morning will be blessed and empowered by your Spirit. Let not one person leave here today unchanged for the cause of Christ. We love you, we praise you, and it is in the precious and powerful name of Jesus we do pray. Amen. Please be seated if you would. I do want to welcome you this morning to First Baptist Church. Perhaps you're here for the first or second or third time. Uh, and if you are, if you would take a few moments of your time in the bulletin, you'll see a portion uh, that has a perforated edge. Uh, this is our Connect card. If you would fill that out, tear that out, and then place it in the offertory plate as you depart our worship center this morning, that'll do two things. It will give us a record of your attendance this morning, but it'll also give us an opportunity to reach out and to thank you for worshiping the Almighty God with us. 
Uh, now, there are a couple things. We're getting ready to do our mission moment in just a moment, but there's a couple things I wanted to do. You see, if I don't do something right at the very beginning when it's fresh in my mind, let's just put it this way. When I'm standing at the end of the service down here, it won't come to my mind. And it's not just because I'm in my 50s, because that happened in my 40s and my 30s as well. But I do want to say congratulations for Danae and for Joshua uh, Riddleman. They were married right here at First Baptist Church yesterday. But in, doing, in, in preparing for this, this wedding that took place, we had so many people that helped and blessed out this young couple getting ready to begin their new family. And so I do want to uh, uh, thank our staff who did a wonderful job just getting things ready, uh, getting them prepared for the wedding. But also we had some wonderful volunteers. And so uh, what a blessing we are to have Joan Blessing. Did you get that? What a blessing. I, I, I'm quick with those wonderful words. Uh, a blessing it is to have Joan Blessing and Mary Ray as they help decorate them. Todd was in here helping to set up as well. And so it's just what a blessing it is to have such wonderful people volunteer. But also, we did a bridal shower for this young couple. And so I just want to thank uh, uh, Leanne, make sure I get everybody, Leanne, Megan, and Davia as they set up for this. Now, they had other people help, but they set up for a wonderful bridal shower that took place in our cab or in the CAB lounge. And they just did a wonderful time, uh, job taking care of this young couple who really, uh, in a sense, just moved into this town. And so what a blessing to have so many people who are volunteers. And speaking of volunteers, if you've noticed outside, our sidewalks are no longer brown, if you know what I mean, dirt. We've had three men these last three weeks come in uh, on their own time and just power wash everything they can get their hands on. I think they even got me one morning when I came in. Uh, so I, I do want to say a thank you to them. Bobby Player, Jesse Adams, and Steve Hart, they've done a wonderful job just showing up and getting some work done around here. So what a blessing it is to have so many people in prayer. There's one final thing that I wanted to share before we get started with Mission Moments, and that is this Saturday we had a, an opportunity as a nation to begin praying for our nation. As you know, Franklin Graham held a, a prayer for the nation rally in Washington, D.C. And if you've seen the pictures, if you watch the videos, you would see that a tremendous crowd showed up to be in prayer for our nation. And so what we started as well two days ago was our prayer for the nation for the next 40 days. If you haven't gotten one of these, please get one. And that'll give you our scripture reading, which we've been doing all year round. Uh, but it'll have some scripture in there that will also allow us to focus on prayer for our nation. And so with that in mind, join us as we pray for 40 days. This started on uh, Friday, and uh, if you uh, do it all, uh, all the way through for the 40 days, it will conclude on the morning of our national election, November 3rd. So join us as we pray for our nation. Uh, this morning, we get to enjoy our mission moment. Sometimes I have people from within the church share with us missions and ministries taking place. But one of the entities that we support as a church is the House of Hope of the PD. And so this morning, we have our executive director for the House of Hope, uh, Brian Braddock, who's going to come and share with us for a few moments about what's going on with the House of Hope. Thank you, preacher. I appreciate the opportunity to be here in person. Um, with COVID, I haven't been able to visit churches like I, like I usually do through the summer and through the fall. And so it's nice to be here today and, you know, practicing all the safety measures. But, you know, there's nothing to me um, more valuable than, than being around the, the body of believers. You know, the Bible says, don't forsake the gathering. And I know why that is. You kind of get um, spiritually ill when you're not around um, believers and you can't encourage each other. So I'm glad to be here this morning with y'all. Um, like the preacher was saying, my name is Brian Braddock. I've been with the House of Hope almost seven years now, which is hard to believe, Brenda. Time, time flies when you're having fun. You know, whether you're having fun or not, I think it, it flies. But uh, we've been very blessed. I wanted to give you an update. A lot of people have asked, you know, how the ministry has done through, you know, the COVID, the pandemic, and how we are financially. And, and what I can tell you is that God has really blessed our ministry in the, this year. Um, just in, in all avenues, when, when we put, we decided early on that we were going to put service to the people in need first and foremost and, and figure out how we could do that safely. 
And we have had a, a few COVID cases here and there, but through putting protocols and practices in place, we remained open and, and we continue to serve people in need throughout the whole, um, this whole time and continue to do so today. And I'm just, um, I'm, I'm blessed that we have a staff that's so committed and a board that's so committed that we're not going to look at, you know, closing our doors at a time when people need us the most. And God has really rewarded that. Our ministry right now is probably in the best financial situation that we have been in. I know in the seven years that I've been, been here, but probably in the last 10 to 15 years. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, come Christmas and, and Thanksgiving when you usually do your giving, that doesn't mean that we don't need it. We continue to need it. I don't want to give that message, but I want to tell you that God has really blessed us. We're in a very good place, so much so that we decided we've been working on this tiny house village project. I hope y'all have read about that or heard about that. And um, we were trying to decide, you know, do we need to do that right now? Because building the homes is, is one part of it, but once you do it, you got to operate. And uh, we were really depending on, you know, different things from the Mission Mart and, and different giving to make sure that we could operate those um, tiny homes. And seeing God move, we took a step of faith and we broke ground two weeks ago on the tiny homes. And so those 24 tiny houses, which will offer long-term care to men, women, and children and families for 18 to 24 months. It's really going to serve a huge need in our ministry where someone can come into the emergency shelter, but they can stay with us for a period of time, up to two years, to really get, you know, first and foremost, grounded in their faith, you know, with our Christian discipleship, connected to a local church, but in addition to that, you know, food, shelter, clothing, but job training and parenting and, and get their finances right so that when they transition, they can transition, you know, into independent living with a good foundation where they won't find themselves in the same situation, you know, years from now. So we're very excited about that. You'll see uh, houses start to go up pretty soon. The infrastructure work um, will probably take about 120 days, and then we will start framing out and building foundations, I would think, early next year, January, February. So um, please come by. We have a model tiny home on site right now so that you can see what it'll look like inside and, and get a good idea of the accommodations. Um, but the biggest thing for me with the tiny homes is the dignity that we can offer people. You know, it's one thing to, to house someone in a shelter or in communal living, um, but nothing replaces the value of a home. And when you can you know, if you're like me, at the end of the day, when I can go into my home and I can shut the door and, and there's just a sense where I just let it all go, you know, we haven't been able to offer that. And I'm very excited about that. I envision that, you know, one day in early spring next year, you know, an eight, nine, ten-year-old little boy or little girl is going to get off the bus and, and they're going to run to their home. They're going to tell their friends, that's where I live. And to me, that's the most important thing. If, if we can give them something that they can be proud of. And, and right now, tiny homes are pretty, pretty popular. I, I have people all the time say, gosh, I want to live there. I want to live there. Well, um, you know, it's, it's good to be able to do a project that really um, excites the community. We've been able to raise enough money to fully fund 16 homes, and we have all but one home uh, committed. So, uh, and the infrastructure we've raised uh, probably about 80% of the infrastructure money. So God has just been so good, blessed us so much. Uh, we appreciate this church, and, and especially because, you know, and Brenda should tell this story better than, better than I could, but First Baptist Church, a Sunday school class, cared for this ministry in its infancy. The House of Hope would not be where it is today um, without this church taking, taking a vision of a couple to serve those in need and, and, and putting that into an organization and putting structure around it and putting funds in it and helping pay off debt, we would not be where we are today without this church. And so we're forever grateful um, for what y'all have done for us to get us to this point. That seed that y'all planted years ago and, and watered over the last 30 years has grown into a ministry now that serves over 1,200 people a year. And once we have these tiny homes, we'll be looking at serving 1,500 people a year. I'm not even going to tell you how much laundry and meals that is, but it's a lot. And employees, almost 50 people a year. 
You know, most people don't know that. So you, you, what y'all have done and what God has blessed has put us in a situation where we can take people that are in the worst situation and, and put them in a place where, first and foremost, they'll know Jesus Christ, you know, and his love and his sacrifice and the path of salvation. And they'll have a body of believers around them, but they will have all the tools necessary to transition out of their out of their situation in life to a situation of being able to to live, work, and um, and and be able to be a part of our society in a way that they can be proud proud of and give back. So thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. I'm going to stick around. Preacher, sit on the front row. So um, take some good notes, and I'm excited to be here. Thank y'all very much. Don't go I want to have a prayer for the uh, one of the things we like to do is make sure we pray for our. Uh, uh, various ministries and missions. I just want to reiterate something he said. Uh, um, there is still a need, and if you're a Sunday school, you can put together a group that wants to sponsor one of those homes. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. I believe it's somewhere around $250 a month. A group of people, is that right? 200 a month. Yeah, 200 a month, and that helps to run that home, provide for that home throughout the year. And it's a three-year agreement, and so if you wanted to get together with a group of people, I'm sure we could uh, easily get a group of people that can afford that in order to help out the House of Hope. We continue to support them with our budget, but we should support them in every way we possibly can. Uh, I do want to pray for Brother uh, Brian and for the House of Hope, but let me uh, uh, give you some information you may or may not know. Uh, Brian is also the candidate for mayor this year, coming in November 3rd. So uh, uh, I've said it before, but what this nation needs is men and women of God to step out of the comfort zone and to help take care of this nation to include at the community level. So I mention that because if you want to have a, uh, uh, any questions for Brother Brian, if you, have, uh, if you want to uh, uh, show your support to him afterwards, he'll be down front. Just come and talk to him. He's easy to talk to. All right? So I'm going to pray for you and for the House of Hope. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, right now we come to you just so thankful, Lord God, uh, that so many years ago you put in the, the mind and in the imagination of, of a couple, of many people, to, uh, to meet a need that was dire in our community, and that is helping out those who have been homeless. And Lord, out of that, you've brought together this, this organization of the House of Hope of the PD, and we pray, Lord God, uh, for each and every one of the staff members that Brother Brian mentioned. Uh, we thank you for their love and their heart for others. But Lord, we're, we're prayerful right now for all the residents, for all those who are in need. Lord, uh, our prayers go out to you that uh, uh, this organization, we as a church, we as a community, will be able to do our very best to, to eradicate the homelessness in this community. And Lord, we're so thankful that uh, we have organizations such as the House of Hope that leads the way. And so right now, I pray, Lord God, for Brian as he leads this group. I pray, Lord God, that you will continue to strengthen him as he goes through this season of time, not only with the uh, uh, directing the House of Hope, but even with the, the pressures of a campaign. Lord, I pray that you would bless him. And Lord, uh, I pray right now that the House of Hope will flourish in such a way uh, that uh, even the imagination that, they, that, that Brian has shared and others have shared will be so, so surpassed by your power, by your, your, your supply, by your greatness, that uh, this organization will be so known uh, even across this nation as one that truly is helping out in the community. So bless, Lord, uh, the House of Hope. Bless our continued efforts in supporting them. And Lord God, bless, uh, uh, our, uh, bless us to rise up and meet the need that is so full before us today. Again, we praise you. We thank you. And it is in the precious and powerful name of Jesus we do pray. Amen. Thank you, Brian, for sharing for us. And we look forward to whatever else you have to share. Well, we're going to continue to worship an almighty God as uh, brother... Uh, man, he, he moved quickly. Brother Andrew, Andrew shares with us in song. Thank you. 
So what do we do with that amazing love? We walk with God every day. And how do we know to walk with God? Through His Word, His timeless Word. Through Him, we, need to, we learn to trust His Word, to obey His Word, and then to accept the abundant life that only He can give. Join me, please, in singing hymn number 500, Trust and Obey, and let's stand as we sing all four stanzas.
and be seated. Part of trusting and obeying is believing, believing that in Christ alone all of our needs are met. There's a wonderful song bit written by Stuart Townsend and, and Keith Getty a few years ago that just reminds us that Christ alone is all we need. That's the simple message of it.
Amen. That is a beautiful song, beautiful arrangement, and beautifully sung. Thank you, choir, for blessing our souls. If you will, turn in your Bibles to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. This morning we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 10. The elevator has been around for many centuries, if you don't already know. But it wasn't really until the late 1800s, early 1900s that uh, electricity was put to the test and uh, elevators were then started to be put into buildings and into usage. Now I give you that quick uh, information, historical data, in order to get to the story. Uh, years ago there's a uh, a family that lived in the haulers of Kentucky. We're talking in the Appalachian regions, eastern Kentucky. And uh, the father had never really been but a couple times to the big city, but he had never seen an elevator before. He had to go to the big city of Lexington one time. The lawyer had something to give to him about his property, and he had to go into town and since he has only been to the big city a couple times, his son had never been to the big city. So he decided to take his boy with him. And so they get to this tall building where the lawyer housed his business. And they looked up at it and they, they knew it was like on the sixth floor and they were a little concerned about getting up there. They go into the front and they see an information booth and they go into that and they talk to a person. And the person said, well, you can just take an elevator to the sixth floor. The gentleman didn't really know exactly. He's heard about the elevator, but didn't really see one in operation. And he says, uh, well, where is the elevator? And she said, well, you just go over to that door over there, push that button, wait for it to open, get in, find another button that says six, and then you can go on up the elevator. So he went over to the elevator with his boy in tote, and he begins to look at it and started to push the button. And he said, well, let's just step back for a moment and see how this thing operates. So he stepped back and after a few moments this elderly lady with a cane comes walking in. She walks up to the elevator, pushes a button, the button lit up. And all of a sudden there's this loud little noise going on and there was a ding and the door opened and this elderly lady walked in. The door closed, she did something. The door closed and he heard this loud noise and all of a sudden the noise stopped. A few moments later the noise started again. And it stopped and he heard a ding and this door opened up and this young lady walked in. And he grabbed his boy by the shoulder and said, Boy, I told you we should have brought your mother. <laughs> wouldn't it be wonderful, wouldn't it be wonderful if there was a door that you can go through that will make you new? Isn't it, wouldn't it be wonderful if there's a door that you can go through that will transform your life. Well, there is. It's not a place in a building. It's a person and his name is Jesus. As you know, over the last three weeks, we've been looking at the topic of knowing the divine. We've been examining the various statements of Christ. The deific declarations is what I've called it over these last few weeks. That Jesus made about himself that indeed he is God. We began with John chapter 8 where Jesus said, uh, before Abraham was, I am. We then went to John chapter 6, you know, the feeding of the 5,000. And where Jesus, when he met them for a second time the next day, Jesus said of himself, I am the bread of life. Last week we were back at the John chapter 8 and verse 12 where we looked at when Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Today we find ourselves in John chapter 10 and verse 1 through 10 where Jesus tells us, I am the door of the sheep. In honor of God's word, would you please stand with me as I read John chapter 10 verses 1 through 10. Most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. 
And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice, yet will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of, a strangers, or of strangers. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not uh, understand the things which he spoke to them. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, again, what a blessing it is to read your word openly, out loud. And Lord, what an even greater blessing it is to gather here with fellow believers. And even more so, Lord, to feel your presence through the person of your spirit. Lord, as we concentrate upon the person of your son, the second person of the Trinity, and the wonderful truth surrounding his deific declarations, I pray, Lord God, we will allow your spirit to speak to our hearts and be our teacher and our guide. For it's in the precious name of Jesus we do pray. Amen. Please be seated. The passage we just read is actually part of a larger discourse uh, that Jesus was giving on what it means to be the true shepherd. Uh, that passage is John chapter 10 verses 1 all the way through verse 20. In fact, you would say it goes all the way to verse 30. Uh, Jesus, during that time, was talking about what it meant to be a true shepherd. Uh, after all, Israel had so many false shepherds. They weren't leading the sheep as they were called to lead the sheep. And yet Jesus uh, contrasts and compares what it means to be the true shepherd. Now make no mistake, by the time this discourse was complete... By the time he got to uh, uh, what we would call verse 30, if you were to look back at our, at our text and look at verse 31, what you would find is the Jewish religious leaders, again, as they've done in the past, pick up stones in order to kill Jesus for blasphemy. They understood what Jesus was saying. They understood that Jesus was proclaiming to be God. And so as we study this particular deific declaration by Christ. I want us to understand what he means by saying, I am the door of the sheep. Uh, in fact, as we get through the rest of this passage, uh, the Lord willing, next Sunday, uh, as we look, there are actually two such proclamations. The one we're looking at this morning is when Jesus says, I am the door of the sheep. And then the Lord willing, we'll look at the second one when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. So with that in mind, I only want us to look at two parts of this passage, the first ten verses we read. The first part is uh, Jesus gives to us a parable. But the second part is the actual proclamation. And what I want us to look at is the perspective that we are to have in both areas. So first, I want us to discover the, the parable in proper perspective. The parable in proper perspective. In the first five verses, Jesus gives to us a parable. Now, how do we know it's a parable? Well, Jesus literally tells us in verse 6, or should I say the narration of John tells us about Jesus in verse 6. It says Jesus used this illustration. We see that in the New King James Version. In the King James Version, it's the word parable. If you're looking at the English Standard Version, it would uh, say something slightly different, such as a figure of speech. But the bottom line is the Greek word there is the Greek word from which we derive the word parable from. It's made up of two root words. The first part is para, which means besides. The second part is, is oamas, which means way or wayside. And it means together to come alongside. So Jesus is telling us a parable. And he's trying to place this parable alongside what he's the point he's trying to get across to the Pharisees and to the Jewish religious leaders. So we find here a parable in proper perspective. 
Now, there are a number of things I want to share about this parable, both how it came about and what Jesus had to say or how and why he said things. I want us to look at the first element of this parable. It actually begins before the parable. I've refer, I'm referring to it as the confrontation. In other words, why did Jesus begin this conversation and why did he begin it with a parable? If you were to go back in your Bibles and look at John chapter 9, what you would find is Jesus healing a blind man, healing a person who was blind from birth. But in doing so, he did it on the Sabbath. And so the Jewish religious leaders were not too happy with Jesus. Number one, they don't like it when Jesus heals somebody. Number two, he did it on the, the sacred day, the Sabbath. They, got, they were so upset that when they brought this, this blind beggar, now who could see before them, they excommunicated him from the church just because he was healed by this man whom he couldn't even uh, tell their name of and he would not uh, uh, blaspheme him. And so they excommunicated this blind man. And they were not happy with Jesus, but they also overheard Jesus say something to this man. When Jesus met up with this man later, Jesus proclaimed that he was the Son of God in the hearing of these people. They were not too happy. And they were in the midst of a confrontation with Jesus. And because of this confrontation, Jesus begins this discourse with this parable. So we begin here with the confrontation. That brings about the parable. But he begins the parable with a caution. Look again at that first uh, verse. Most assuredly I say to you, who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs up another way, the same as a thief and a robber. Now the caution is obvious. Jesus begins his parable by saying that there are some people who are going to attempt to lead the sheep astray. They, we, they won't come from the front door because they don't want their faces seen. Rather, they'll come up in a, another fashion. They'll find a different way into the fold because they are simply thieves and robbers. There's a caution we ought to take from this passage. And that is simply this. Not everyone is going to be straight with you. Not everyone is going to teach and live by the truth. The truth being the word of God. Not everyone who says I am a follower of Jesus is a follower of Jesus. In the Sermon on the Mount which we, which we went through at the very beginning of this year... Jesus had been pointed that out. He said, there will be some who come to me and say, Lord, Lord, but I'm not going to know them. I'm going to send them away. I never knew you. There are people in this world who will mislead us. They will be, pretend to be shepherds, yet they are robbers and thieves. There's a caution that comes in this parable. So it begins with a caution. It's brought to us by way of the confrontation... But then Jesus begins to give us the contrast. Look again, if you will, at verses 2 in the first part of verse 3. It says, But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper uh, opens. The contrast is very simple. There are some who are false sheep who don't want to show their face, who will are false shepherds, who will come by a different means. They will climb up over the wall. They'll do something different, but they won't come from the gate. But there are some who will come by way of the door, and that one is the shepherd. In fact, if we were to take a cultural look at what took place in the New Testament times, we would find out more information about what it means to be a shepherd, what it means to have a sheep fold. Often the sheep folds were uh, made by uh, natural uh, resources. In other words, they would move the sheep into a place that perhaps had cliffs or thickets that would block them in, and that's where they would put them. And then the shepherd or the under-shepherd themselves, they would literally lie across the only access point for the sheep. So if anybody or any of the sheep tried to get out of the fold, they would already know what they're attempting to do. And so the shepherd, in a sense, is also the doorway. The under-shepherd is also the doorway. 
many of the shepherds would gather together with two or three different flocks and they'd put them into the same fold and they'd all either sleep at the door or be a part of the door or one would take charge while the other one goes and takes a break and he'd know exactly who was coming back because they would come to the door and they'd recognize them as the shepherd. So we have a contrast, but there's a uh, taking place here. It's between those who do not belong and it's be between those who do belong. It's between those who are the dedicated shepherd and those who simply want to seek and destroy. It's a confrontation, a confrontation that brought us to this parable. It begins with a caution, but we see the contrast. The door is there, the doorkeeper opens the door to those who belong, the shepherd. This brings us to the call as we continue to look at the parable in proper perspective. Verses 3, the last part of verse 3 and verse 4, it says, To him, to that shepherd, to that one who comes to the doorkeeper, to him the doorkeeper opens. And listen to this, the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when they bring out his own sheep, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. The shepherd is genuine. The shepherd is personal. He knows his sheep by name and they know his voice. That's how you can tell the difference between a false shepherd who seeks to destroy and a, the true shepherd that Jesus is getting to. So we find here the call taking place. The sheep were so familiar with a shepherd's voice. That is the shepherd's voice that would calm them down. It wasn't the matter that they were surrounded by other like-minded sheep. No, no. It was the shepherd's voice that calmed their fears. It was the shepherd's voice that led them in and out of the fold. It was the shepherd's voice that led them to their feed, that led them to still waters. It was the shepherd's voice that kept them from wandering away. It was the shepherd's voice that brought them back when they were lost. We see here the call, and that call is the shepherd's voice. But the parable continues. It concludes really with the, cert uh, the certainty Yet, it says in verse 5, yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him. For they do not know the stranger's voice. Have you ever attempted to round up an animal that, you, that didn't know you and you didn't know it? We're talking a stray dog. Have you ever called and corralled them and tried to encourage them just to have that dog run you around in circles? And yet, that's what happens. When a sheep does not hear its master's call, when a sheep does not hear the shepherd's voice, there is uncertainty. When a stranger attempts to corral them, they will not follow him. But there is certainty in the shepherd's voice. There is certainty that comes with their shepherd being in control and with them. A stranger trying to control a flock is like what my wife would often call herding cats, as she refers to her fifth graders during science projects. And yet with the shepherd's voice, there is certainty in the following. The parable in proper perspective. But there's a sixth part of this parable. It's really outside the parable. And so let me give you the conclusion. In verse 6, John provides a narrative to conclude the parable, to give us more information of what is taking place. Again, verse 6, it says this, Jesus used this illustration, this parable, but then it says, but they did not understand things which he had spoken of them. The conclusion is simply this, it was confusing to those who were hearing. But let me tell you this, they were not confused by the parable. In their day, they would have understood everything that Jesus was saying. They would have understood what it meant to be a, sheep, uh, she a shepherd leading sheep. They would have understood what he meant when he said the, she the sheep hear the shepherd and they know his voice. They would have understood the robber and the thief taking the outside route to get to the sheep. They understood the words that were coming out of his mouth, what they didn't understand, what confused them is why is Jesus 
telling us this story? Why is Jesus giving us an illustration when we're in the midst of a confrontation, when we're trying to blast him for healing a man because he did it on the Sabbath, when he didn't stop this man from worshiping him, when he referred to himself as the Son of God, what on earth does this parable have to do with our conversation? Well, that's the second part of the message. So we can look at the parable in proper perspective. But really, we want to also examine the proclamation in proper perspective as well. But before we get there, let me ask this question. Do you see confusion in this world? When we look around at uh, what's taking place in politics, when we look around at what's taking place on our streets, when we look around and hear what's what, what is in the minds of many of the people in this nation, there is confusion. It wasn't just confusions because of the Pharisees, but we have confusion in our world today. And I'm here to tell you, if we are to present a parable similar to this, on the streets of our world today, there would be confusion in the midst of confrontation because they would stand there, listen to what you're saying, understand the words coming out of our mouths, but not knowing how to apply it to their lives. But Jesus helps us out here, doesn't he? So let's go ahead and do, look at, at the proclamation in proper perspective in order to gain a, a, a better understanding, perhaps, of what he means by I am the door of the sheep. He doesn't just say it once, he says it twice. In, in verse 7 he says, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. And then in verse 9 he gives us the, the shortened proclamation, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, and I will go in and out and find pastures. Four things I want us to know about this proclamation. Uh, number one, we should take a look at the discernment. And I'm not talking about the discernment of the people. I'm talking about the discernment of Christ to look upon man, to look upon their hearts, to understand the confusion that they have, and then to understand why they are confused. We see here the discernment of Christ in that these who were listening were not properly hearing, that they were li listening to the physical actions he was describing and not uh, applying the spiritual connotations. There was a discernment by Christ to go a step further. And so he does. He adds something to this parable that allows them to start to get the picture of what he's talking about. Most assuredly, Jesus says, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Isn't that amazing? Jesus tells this parable that any uh, normal person would look at and say, okay, I understand what you're saying, but so I'm missing something. And Jesus says, yes, you are. What you're missing is who I represent in this parable. You see, as he says who I represent, he says, I am the door. Then you can also try to figure out who everyone else represents. Jesus gives to us some clarification. He helps us because of his discernment. We see the discernment of Christ as he gives them that vital piece of information that is missing. But then in this discernment, we should take note of the discernment of the sheep. Didn't Jesus just say that they hear my voice? Uh, whoever, he says, came by, uh, before me, they were thieves and robbers. But listen, it says, but the sheep did not hear them. Jesus is getting a little personal now. Because when we think about the thieves and robbers, and we'll go over this in a moment, surely we can point to Satan. But in the context, in the cultural context of this parable, Jesus was referring to the religious leaders of his day. The discernment among the sheep. The parable in proper perspective. We see the, the, the discernment of Christ but also the discernment of those who know God because they will hear his voice and they will follow him. So what begins with the discernment continues. 
We also see here the deliverance. It's promised by Christ. Jesus said the second time, I am the door. And then he adds to it, if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Now, whereas the discernment points to the identity of the door, Jesus, the deliverance points to the function of the door, salvation. Jesus says, if they go by me, they will be saved. Isn't that the mission statement of Christ? If we were to turn to, say, Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, Jesus says, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. That's his job. That's what he wants us to understand about him, that he's here to save us. And if you hear my voice and follow me, you will be saved. So we see here the discernment, but there's the deliverance as well. Two things about this deliverance. First of all, the door of deliverance, Jesus, is the only access point for the sheep. He is the solitary access point for the sheep. Jesus said, I am the door. He did not say, I am a door. I am one of many door. If you choose my door, it's a pretty good one. No, Jesus said, I am the door. It was definitive. Jesus does this quite often. We see it in John chapter 14, verse 6. Another I am statement that we'll study in a couple weeks. When Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then he adds to it the emphasis, no one comes unto the Father except through me. So there's an access point and there's only one of them. There's one door for the sheep and his name is Jesus. The deliverance points to the function of the door. And that door is Jesus, and he is the solitary access point towards salvation. There's a second thing I'd like us to know, and that as the door of deliverance, that being Jesus, is not only the only access point to deliverance, to sal uh, salvation, but he is the only access point to true liberty. He's the only access point to true liberty. You know, liberty is a big buzzword today, isn't it? with the election coming up, with the mouthpieces speaking all over the world. Liberty is something that's big in our minds. But true delivery doesn't come because the next president. True deliver, uh, delivery or true victory and liberty comes in Jesus Christ. Jesus says, if you, if you hear my voice and follow me, if you're one of my sheep, I will lead you in and out of pasture. In and out of the fold. Because Jesus gives to us true liberty. Uh, the door Jesus liberates for us from the, the, uh, the ills of sin. The, uh, Jesus, the door, will see us through the storms of life. Jesus, the door, he will provide for us in the heat of battle. Jesus, the door, he's the one that gives us the assurance because the victory has already been won. Jesus, the door, he is the one that will acquit us from our guilt. Because he's taken that guilt upon himself. The proclamation in proper perspective begins with the discernment of Jesus Christ. But we also see that he promises us the deliverance as well. There's a third element of this proclamation. And I'm calling that the defense. Look now, if you will, at verse 10 in our text. Jesus says, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy I have come that, I may, that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. The same thief and robber from the beginning of the uh, parable is the picture here. Uh, I, I've said it before, I said it a moment ago, that sure, we can call Satan as ultimately the thief, the robber, the murderer. But so are those who do not follow the ways of God. Because if you're not following the ways of God, you're following the ways of Satan. And Jesus calls him a thief and a robber. And the, the, the illicit purpose in mind is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. You understand that's the modus operandi of Satan, don't you? As described to us by the Apostle Peter. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8 it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Satan will never be satisfied with the misery of mankind. He wants much more than that. He wants misery for all eternity, for all people. 
If you're saved, then he will seek to make sure your witness is ineffective. And if you're unsaved, he will do his very best to make sure you never are. He seeks to destroy us. And these that Jesus is pointing out, the thief, the robber, they fall in line with Satan in that they're here to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Satan seeks to keep you on the road to destruction rather than on the road to eternal life. Because that is what he wants for you and me. You see here the defense. Jesus proclaimed, I am the door of the sheep. It includes the discernment, the deliverance, the defense. To all who become part of the flock of God. But there's a fourth element here. I'm calling it the delight. In other words, Jesus continues, I have come, says the Lord that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Again, you see the contrast versus the thief and the robber who comes to kill, to steal, uh, kill and destroy. No, Jesus says that I've come to give life and to give it abundantly. What a contrast. It is the delight of Christ to provide for his flock. Uh, think about that. Uh, uh, I've got uh, two daughters, two uh, son-in-laws, Three grandchildren, well, one on the way. What a delight it is to provide for them. What a delight it is for me to, to do my best to care for them. Deborah and I went yesterday to our grandson's first birthday. We drove 10 hours to spend three hours with him, and every minute was worth it. Why? Because we want to do our very best to provide for them. Jesus wants to do his very best to provide for his flock. What an assurance. Paul tells us like this, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 9, And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And our text this morning says he provides for us not just abundantly, but more abundantly. And let me tell you this, that's not talking about eternal life in heaven. That's as, as abundant as it gets. He's talking about in the here and now. Right now, Jesus wants to provide for you. He wants to provide abundantly for us in the here and now. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, Paul gives us a somber look at this same principle because of the way he puts it. Galatians 2.20, I have been, listen, crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Well, what's the connection there? When you live for Jesus Christ, you are living an abundant life. In the midst of pain and trials, you're living an abundant life. In the midst of COVID-19, you're living an abundant life. And if you're not, then perhaps you're just not living in Christ. Because that's the promise of his word. That we can live an abundant life no matter what is taking place in our lives. You see, that's the proclamation from a proper perspective. The discernment, the deliverance, the, the defense, but it ends in the delight. All of that is found in the one who said, I am the door of the sheep. It was a deific declaration because when you put this proclamation and place it alongside the proclamation we'll look at next week when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd who gives his life for the sheep. What you have is Jesus reminding the people, I am God. I want to conclude with another door. This door is found in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 20. We stay with the words of Christ, but he's knocking at a different door. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Jesus, the perfect gentleman, is knocking at our heart's door. He will let us know that he is there. And he tells us, All you have to do is hear my voice. And the sheep follow. Hear my voice. Open the door. And Jesus says, I will come in and dine with you. 
He enters as a guest because you have to invite him. But he stays as the host for the rest of your life. The plea of Christ is let me in. The plea of your pastor from this pulpit is please let Jesus in. He's knocking and he is the door. Let's go to him now in prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you this morning. We're so thankful, Lord God, with these proclamations that Jesus has made that uh, men and women have studied through the centuries and have found that they've brought us into a closer relationship with you through your Son as you have revealed to us more of his nature, as you have revealed to us more of his compassion for us. And so, Lord God, I pray right now for that someone who may be present this morning who has not taken that step of faith to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. I pray, Lord God, that your spirit is speaking to their hearts through your word. But I pray for the majority of us who are present, who are professed Christians. Lord, may we draw closer as we study you. May we learn a little bit more about your son. And may we live a whole lot better than we have in the past. May we live for your son, Jesus Christ. Change our hearts. Change us now. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're going to stand and sing our hymn of decision, our hymn of invitation. Hymn number 419, Jesus Calls Us or the Tumult. Let's stand together, hymn number 419, and let's praise the Lord. Amen. I do hope you have a wonderful week and I pray even more that someone will come your way that will question you in such a way that you might even have to think about it for a while. But we need to stand up on our faith, stand out and stand up. We need to share our faith every opportunity we have. So pray along with me as we continue to pray for our nation, but pray that God would send somebody in your way, somebody in your path that you can share Jesus with, that you can share the truth of the gospel with. A couple things that are taking place that I want to highlight. Uh, number one is, uh, you know, in October, we're beginning something new. Each month we've begun a different ministry or we regathered doing another ministry that we've done in the past. And so in October, we will begin our Sunday evening services. So on the first Sunday evening of October, we'll be meeting back in here at 6 p.m. And we will begin uh, with the elements of the Lord's Supper. So that'll be a special evening and you'll want to come and join us. Uh, also, uh, in October, we're going to be having our first, uh, you might want to call it, full church gathering. Uh, we are going to have a, a fall uh, family celebration on the second Wednesday uh, um, on the second Wednesday during our normal Bible study time, uh, we're going to be having Chick-fil-A meals, a boxed meals, but we're going to have some games for the kids, some games for the adults, and we're just going to have a good time in fellowship. And so if you're planning on attending, then do a couple things. Number one, 
please do attend. But number two, call the church office, put your name on the list so we can make sure we order the right amount of meals for it. And then the third thing is simply this. If you are interested in talking with Brother uh, Brian, uh, he's down front here, please come and either uh, ask questions that you might have with the upcoming election or uh, show your uh, support. If you have uh, campaign money, don't give it to him, but he'll tell you how you can help. How's that sound? All right. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll be on our way. Heavenly Father, what a blessing it is to be in your house. Thank you uh, for the beautiful music, for the praises that were sung. Thank you, Lord God, for the prayers that were lifted. Thank you, Lord God, for the souls that were present. And thank you, Heavenly Father, for your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray a blessing upon each of us this week as we go our way. And I do pray that you'll allow us to share Jesus with others. It's in the precious name of Jesus we do pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. Here at FBC Florence, we're a family, and we'd like to thank you for joining our family for worship this morning. This broadcast is made possible by the generous and loving contributions of the members and friends of First Baptist Church of Florence.